Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nassim. I'm a third year PhD student at the University of Technology, Sydney. And today I'm going to talk about some results about molecular investigation of heavy metal stress in Zostra mullera. So we all know that seagrasses are important because they are the primary food source of the large number of fishes and marine invertebrates and they oxygenate in water and they are the major blue carbon source in the ocean. But unfortunately, as a result of anthropogenic activity, they are declining at the rate of 7%. And only in Australia, we already lost 79% of seagrasses in Western Australia uh, since 1950. So copper is a heavy metal and also is an anthropogenic toxicant for seagrasses, as it can actually add into the water um, as, a two, as two major sources, either the agricultural waste runoff or acid mine drainage. So here's uh, some of the um, recent incidents for the acid mine drainage. For example, in 2010, we had this the waste tank from, uh, from a copper mine leaking to a river in China. Also, we had two incidents of acid mine drainage, one in British Columbia and the other one in Tasmania in 2016. So usually when copper is adding to the water, it either kills seagrasses at high concentration or it will be absorbed by the tissue and because, because they are the primary food source for the, uh, for the fishes, then they, the contaminant will add into the marine food web. So it's not only negatively affect fisheries, but also um, human health. So the toxic level of copper concentration for seagrasses are species specific, and also the level of uh, copper in each of those uh, contaminated sites varies. So the, here's just one of the examples showing that in one contaminated site, we could have uh, the range of the, uh, the copper um, concentration between the range of 0 0.1 up to 100 milligram per liter uh, of copper. But we know in the family of seagrasses that we're working on, it's just the family of Zostracea, uh, the concentration between 0 0.1 to 1 milligram per liter of copper has negatively effect uh, on the photosystem efficiency. So uh, for that reason, we uh, chose two concentrations of copper, 250 and 500 microgram per liter in Zostra mulleri, which is a common seagrass in Australia, New Zealand, and Papua New Guinea, to answer two research questions. First is, what's the overall molecular mechanism driving responses to excessive level of copper in Zostra mulleri? And the second one is, is there a relationship between a copper concentration and toxicity responses? So um, from the previous results, we know that the physiological responses on the copper toxicity is significant. For example, we know the copper accumulation in the leaves of Zostra mulleri is significantly increasing after seven days. And also we know the, the um, effective quantum lead and maximum quantum yield uh, in, after seven days is significantly declining. So for that reason, we collecting the samples at Pittwater, Sydney, New South Wales, and then we transfer all those plants to UTS um, Aquaria facility and expose them to uh, seven days of, uh, of copper. They collect them as, as three biological replicates, and then we extracted the RNA for library preparation and sequencing. So after checking the quality of those, um, those samples, we align them to the, to the genome, and then we use those transcripts in an R package called DSEC2 for creating count charts and fold change. So here's the overall result of um, all the treatment altogether. So if you have a look at the right-hand side, we'll see that the, we have 507 significantly expressed genes in both of those treatments altogether. And uh, these are comprised of uh, 177 genes in the, the treatment of 250 and 470 genes in the treatment of 500. And also, if you have, the, if you have a look at the heat map that uh, we got from the DESEC2 in the left-hand side, we see the read count, which is already Z-scored for the, the variation between the replicates um, on the left-hand side. Uh, so yellow is upregulated and green is downregulated, whereas the, the right-hand side is the log-2-fold change of each treatment compared to control. And in this case, 
red is upregulated and blue is downregulated. Also, what we did was we started to look uh, like, uh, specifically for all those genes, so starting with photosynthesis and carbon fixation. So what we found, first of all, was the, the concentration that we had the significantly expressed genes was only the treatment of 500 in both photosynthesis and carbon fixation. Also, we saw the downregulation of photosystem 1 and the ATP synthase uh, subunit. We didn't see any significantly expressed uh, subunit of photosystem 2, which I'm going to go back to this in later slides. We had the downregulation of uh, Rubisco large subunit. The other thing we found was uh, it was uh, we had the downregulation of cooling transporter. So cooling usually adding to the chloroplast and converting to glycine betaine. So glycine betaine accumulates in response to abiotic stress, but in this case by down regulation of cooling transporter, we could assume that this type of defense mechanism was deactivating after seven days of copper exposure. Also, we found the upregulation of alpha carbonic anhydrase, so it shows that inorganic carbon fixation was adding to the system as an alternative uh, CO2 source. Next, we were looking at glycolysis. So, uh, we saw the upregulation of phosphofructokinase only at the concentration of uh, 500 microgram per liter of copper, whereas for phos uh, fructose bisphosphate aldolase, it was for both treatments. And uh, in the mitochondria, we find two chemical defense mechanisms. One was proline, so proline again um, usually accumulates in mitochondria in response to uh, abiotic stress, but in our case, proline dehydrogenase was downregulating at both concentration of 250 and 500. So again, we could assume that this type of defense mechanism was deactivating after seven days of copper exposure. However, for cytochrome P450, you have the opposite result, so it's upregulating for both concentration. And uh, cytochrome P450 has been previously shown to have a role in detoxification of uh, lead and cadmium, and we could, uh, we could uh, also report that it has a role in copper stress as well. And uh, there was another chemical defense mechanism which was also uh, active after seven days, which was senescence regulator S4 e genes. So uh, that one was upregulating in both uh, concentrations. So um, senescence regulator usually induced under stress gene, uh, gene and hormones, uh, age and hormones. And then in that case, it was one of the active uh, defense mechanism for our copper stress as well. We also had uh, checked the enzymatic defense mechanism, so we, we found the upregulation of peroxidase as 500 microgram per liter of copper only. So it shows that the, the detoxification of uh, hydrogen peroxide was active even after seven days, which was interesting. And also we found the upregulation of glutathione S transferase, so it means that the sequestration of toxic compound to vacuo was also active after seven days. However, uh, we found the down regulation of multi copper oxidase at the concentration of 500 microgram per liter of copper. So, although uh, the plant version of multi copper oxidase, which is ascorbate, um, uh, ascorbate oxidase, is shown to be differentially regulated by different abiotic stress factor, in our case, it was, um, it was not active after seven days of copper exposure. So as for highlights, so we propose that uh, the development of specific biomarkers on the uh, copper toxicity in isostral molluri, also from our previous result um, and also the current result, we, we reported the copper toxicity in isostral molluri is both dose and time dependent. Uh, based on the previous result, we, um, we saw that the suppression in the photosynthesis efficiency after seven days of exposure at both concentration of 200 and 500 microgram per liter of copper. And also the, the previous result on different seagrasses confirmed this um, decrease in the photosynthesis efficiency, which should imply that uh, copper has a negative impact on photosystem too. However, 
when we uh, study the RNA sequencing, we only sh show the, we can only see the down regulation in system one and also in uh, 500 microgram per liter of copper only. So this will give us uh, a question to, to try to answer if there is a significant impact on the regulation of the system two on the copper stress or no. And finally, cytochrome P450 and senescence regulators suggested as copper-induced chemical defense mechanism. So uh, as a part of this project, which is the molecular investigation of heavy metal in Zostria and Mulleri, uh, we did transcriptomic approach, which was today's talk. We also doing proteomic approach, which is um, using eye track protein labeling. And this would actually help us to further investigate the effect of copper stress on uh, photosystem two. So by combining those two methods together, we're hoping it will be a comprehensive omics study to understand the mechanism of copper toxicity at the molecular level for better restoration, conservation, management of seagrasses meadows. So at the end, I want to first of all thank my supervisor, especially Peter, and my collaborator, especially Pim, uh, UTS and Linnean Society for funding this project. I want to thank um, the conference for giving me the opportunity to present my work and I want to thank everyone for their time and attention and I'm happy to answer any possible question. Thank you. Thank you, Nassim. Any questions? Nobody? Oh, oh, Gary has one question. So, so uh, can you give us any hints about your toolkit? You talked a little bit about a toolbox for toxicity. Yeah. Can you give us a few hints about what you think should be in your toolbox? Uh, you mean for the for the final result? Yeah. Well, I would. I assume because we see. Yeah. So I was assuming because we see this uh, decrease in the in the photosynthesis efficiency, I assume that we should see some um, post-translational modification and then as it goes for the, at the proteomic level, we should be able to see uh, some kind of difference in the photosystem too, but, but most, of the time, most of the time the, the gene regulation comes first and then the proteomic comes after. But what we did, we, we collect all the sample for the genomic and proteomic at, at day seven only. So what, what I was assuming, if we actually want to go and have a look at it, it means that you have to collect the sample on day one for genomic and then do proteomic on day seven so that it has the time to, to evolve. Whereas what we want, what we're interested in now is the exact same day, both omic at the same level. So I, I wouldn't be too surprised if I don't see the exact the mirroring of the genomic to the proteomic because the, that wasn't the, the actual designing for the project. But I assume if we do, if we, if we significantly specify one specific pattern, we should have, have give them at this few days and then we will be able to see what is manifest from genomic to the proteomic. But I don't think I will see a significant one at day seven because what we see on day seven is what it was supposed to be on the, on the day three. But, but I think that will be the, definitely the future, future project to, to have a look at why the photosystem uh, two showing a, a different response in the genomic and the proteomic part. Thank you.